Hello, Nick. Hi. How are you? Really well. How are you? I don't know if we have audio. I don't know. Oh. Ah, there, my, all my audio is off. Okay. How do I turn? There. Hello? Hello, can you yeah. hear me? Yes, now I can. I just had my audio off as things that happen. Okay, <laughs> no problem. Uh, can I check to see if I can share my sl slides? Is that okay? Um, ¿El tiene permiso para compartir pantalla? Eh, sí. ¿Tiene permiso para compartir pantalla? ¿El plomly? Creo que todo. Yeah. So, yeah try. They, they think that you have access. No, it says, it says, no, I don't have access. No, I did. Ahora sí? Ahora sí. Now you do. Ah, okay. I think. Okay, let's try. Yes. Perfect. You can see that? Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. Good. Yeah. Excellent. Good. And so, uh, um, so uh, how is this going to work? Somebody's you're going to introduce. Um, yeah. So um, I'll introduce you. Um, it's two thirty, maybe in a um, just a second, and then um, and then I'll pass the. I'll give you the. <laughs> The floor and yeah. then um and then you can speak for you know as we said 45 minutes or something and then we'll open up for some questions at the end um it doesn't have to be an hour and a half but that was just we tried to fix an hour and a half because of the translation to not over text the yeah. people who are translating yeah and um so so somebody's doing simultaneous translation yeah. so, so i'm on yeah. if so i'm going if you to want, so if you want to hear, not that it's important, but if you want to hear the, my presentation of your career, you could push the button down below where it says a little world. Um, and that, that allows you to choose to listen interpretation, I think it is. Uh, at least that's the direct translation of it in Spanish. Um, yeah. And then you, then you would hear it, hear my voice um, in English, because I'm going to speak in Spanish now. Okay, fantastic. So, so if I'm if I'm I sent you the notes um, or the yes. translation of the notes. Uh -huh. So, um, yeah. if it, and, but I've changed a few things, but yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Um, that's okay. But if I'm no, going to okay. ask, then um, please uh, please let me know. Mm -hmm. Just send yeah. a, a note in the chat or something. Recording in progress. Wow, I think the recording is in progress. Aquí está como. Parece que tengo mucho, mucho micrófono aquí conmigo. Yeah. Ah, they're checking the audio. Um, because we had some problems in the morning with uh, the echo. You get, to, you get an echo depending on all of the multiple pieces that are put together here. All the audio, yeah. Mm. Um, 
I'm going to turn off the computer. It should get rid of the echoes. Okay. I'll just stay um, here. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank, Thank you for you. your patience. No, no worries. Ya. Ya. Ahora sí. Vamos a partir. Sí. 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 Uh -huh. yeah. uh -huh. yeah. Okay, we're going to begin in a little while. Yo estoy listo. Sí, así. Hola, hola. Más cerca. Ah, ok. Ahí. ¿Está bien? Hola, hola. Buen día, buenas tardes. Hola. Perdón, ¿cómo, cómo te llamas? Viviana Soto, bienvenida. No la, no la vimos en la mañana, entonces no estábamos todos ahí compartiendo en la mañana. Qué bueno que llegaste bien. ¿Ya? ¿Ya? ¿Entonces listo? Sí. Ya. Muy buenos días. Ay, bueno, muy buenas tardes. Soy Matthew Good Culkin. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Matthew Culkin. I'm the Hulupark Intercultural Urban and Territorial Studies. I want to welcome you to our afternoon session. It is the second version of the International Seminar, Decolonizing Urban Territory. We also say hello to the ones following the streaming through YouTube and Facebook. We made an open call for the people who wanted to reflect and dialogue about property regimes, indigenous appropriations and claims for land in urban and non-urban context, both in North and Global South. In the morning, we had some talks on practices on urban and rural areas. And this afternoon, we're having a masterclass by Nicholas Blumley. Why do we need to talk about this? Because the settler colonialism processes still exist in different places of the world. These processes reduce and shatter the possibility of communities in their territories. That's why we thought it would be important to bring a person who has worked for many decades the topic of property. Nicolas Blomley is a professor of geography at Simon Fraser University. He has a long-standing interest in legal geography, in particular in relation to the the property. He is interested in the speciality of legal practices and relationships on the world making consequences of such legal geography. He has published mainly in different magazines for the last four decades. In different magazines. He has also published his own books. In 2001, Legal Geography Review. In 2004, another one regarding the city. That one is from 2014. It is a legal geography. And recently, this year, Territory New Trajectories in Law. So, 
will it be with Nicholas Bloom? Hello, everyone. I I hope you can you can hear me. Um, I'm uh, I'm delighted to to be here. I just want to make sure that the audio is coming through and the video. Um, uh, so um, I work on that assumption. Uh, I'm thank you. Um, uh, I'm really honored to be here and I want to thank uh, the organizers very much for inviting me to to join you this afternoon. It's morning where I live in I'm coming to you from Vancouver, Canada on the west coast of Canada. Um, and um, I'm going to share my screens with you. Uh, I can find it. There we are. And this is the uh, the title of my uh, my talk: um, Deputies and Outlaws, Law, Territory, and Colonial Dispossession in British Columbia. Um, I should explain a little by way of context that this is uh, a set of ideas that are, are very much under development. This is really the first time I've actually uh, presented these ideas to an audience like this. So. Um, uh, there are still some gaps in the analysis, and I'll explain what those are as we move forward. So I'm very keen to get your ideas and feedback. Um, I uh, understand your themes for your seminar, which sound very exciting, relate to territory, appropriation, indigenous lands, particularly in the city. Uh, this paper, I'm afraid, speaks more to, to rural dispossession, although there will be a connection to the city that I'll explain in a minute. I apologize for speaking in English. I'm afraid I do not have uh, a command of Spanish, which is um, uh, to my loss. Um, if I speak too quickly um, and the translator is unable to follow, then hopefully you'll let me know. Uh, I should also note that this is a project that I have been developing along with a colleague uh, of mine, a local colleague, Brenna Bandar. Brenna has done some phenomenal work on questions of race and colonialism and property. So both of us have been shaping these ideas. Although interestingly, just yesterday, we had a conversation about the ideas and, and she wants to change a set of ideas. So this is the nature of collegial uh, engagement and research. Anyway, um, let me um, move forward in my presentation. And I want to begin with a, a story, a vignette. This is from the 21st of May, 1915, and we are in a place called Bulkley Lake, and Bulkley Lake is in northern uh, British Columbia, which is the province in which I live, which is in Western Canada. And it concerns three men, somebody called Isaac, somebody called Billy Clark, and somebody called Agent Loring. On the 21st of May, 1915, uh, Isaac came before state officials in Northern British Columbia to make a complaint. A man called Billy Clark had claimed to own his Isaac's land and Billy Clark had ordered Isaac and his family to get out. He had threatened them with prison if they did not get out. This had failed. So as a consequence, he had burnt down Isaac's house with his family inside. His wife, he said, had hard work to save the children, thankfully they were saved from death, and had her foot badly burnt. This had happened while Isaac was out hunting. Isaac had reported this matter to somebody called Loring, and Loring had given Isaac some medicine for his wife's burned foot, but then had told him to wait and other matters would be attended to. Whenever Isaac spoke to Mr. Loring about Mr. Clark turning him off his place, expelling him from him and burning his house, Mr. Loring had told him to wait. Nothing had happened. As Isaac says, he now had no land and no home and he wanted help. Now this, of course, objectively looks like a crime scene, an attack, a very, a very direct attack on the personal safety of a family, as well as an assault on their private property. Isaac's home is clearly not his sanctuary, not his castle. The state has failed, it would seem, to respond in any way to the threat against Isaac and his family. There is, as I'm sure you're guessing, an important context to this story, however. 
Isaac is an indigenous man, and he's actually referred to in the testimony as Indian Isaac. Clark is identified as a, quote, white man. Loring is the so-called Indian agent. An Indian agent was a state official who was, in theory at least, given the job of protecting the interests of indigenous people, of Indians, although in reality they are an instrument of colonial power. So the three players in this little story are an indigenous man, Indian Isaac, a white settler pursuing private land, Billy Clark, and a state official, Agent Loring. And we don't know the outcome of Isaac's complaint, but we can guess based on other evidence from the historical record of this time that nothing was done to remedy the dispossession. Isaac continues to have no land and no home. What we want to do in this talk is make sense of Isaac's story and make sense of the forms of violent colonial dispossession that are at play in Bulkley Lake. We want to show that this is not a single incident, that there are many ongoing routine stories of violent colonial dispossession happening uh, at the same time. We want to show that although Clark's actions were technically illegal, they were in violation of the law, they were not entirely removed from law. So we want to bring law back into this story. Property law, we're going to suggest, empowered Clark to do the things he did. Property law also made Isaac vulnerable, legally speaking. And as such, property law not only facilitated this process of dispossession, we're also going to suggest it was actually produced, it was shaped by this colonial violence itself. Now, what happened at Bulkley Lake was not unusual, as I said. It happens again and again. The testimony that Indian Isaac gave was before something called the McKenna McBride Commission. This was a, a government commission, or what's called a royal commission in Canada, established in the early years of the 20th century to uh, resolve questions of reserve disposition, the arrangement of land set aside for Indigenous people. But again and again, despite the narrow focus of this commission, Indigenous people came before the commission and described the destruction of their homes, as well as many, many other forms of violence initiated by white men with claims to their land. And so common were these in the record that they're often mentioned almost as an aside, in passing, in talking about something else. So here we see in this slide a quote, there was a house there, says an indigenous person in describing an area, but the white man destroyed us. He told us to take the house away, but before we could do so, he destroyed it. Indigenous people talk about returning from a hunting trip and finding a white man living in their own home, in echoes of what we find, say, in the West Bank of Palestine today. Dispossession happens on the ground in these intimate moments of embodied violence. So what historian Paige Raymond describes as the micro techniques of dispossession. This is where dispossession is actually happening. Dispossession is also powerfully territorial. It's focused on the removal of indigenous bodies and the indigenous presence from land, including their houses, from land that is now reimagined as exclusively white. So what do these stories tell us about dispossession, law, and property, particularly in relation to what Brenna Banda would call the racial regimes of property and their associated imaginaries and practices? As I said, in this talk, what we want to do is we want to center settler law in what look like apparently illegal practices. We want to bring law back and argue that these aren't completely divorced from or separate from law. Although again, Clark's actions were clearly a violation of settler law in burning down Indian Isaac's house, they were not a radical departure from them. We want to show how property law in particular facilitated Clark, empowering him, making his, facilitating his violent actions while placing Indian Isaac and his family in a place of legal relegation and legal vulnerability. The effect is not only to place people like Isaac and his family and his house at risk, 
it's actually going to make them active targets for settler violence. We also want to argue that the legal practices that made this possible, a policy called preemption, which we'll explain in just one second, was also a colonial product. It was shaped both by the practical constraints of mass land dispossession and also the racialized devaluations of indigenous peoples and their relationships to land. So property law helped make this colonial violence possible but it was also in turn made through the colonial encounter and associated forms of colonial violence. So let me explain what preemption is. Preemption was a policy, is a policy, a doctrine, whereby a person, a settler, can claim a portion of land that is deemed unowned usually state land that is unowned. And after a certain period of time, after performing certain appropriate practices, they can gain private property rights to that land. They can gain title to the land. So it's a process through which state land can be reallocated to settlers. Now in British Columbia, this entailed a series of rules and we're gonna come back to these rules because they're going to be important. They applied only to, uh, effectively, only to white men. Sometimes widows were allowed, but basically this is for white men. It's not for indigenous people, as we'll see. White men could claim up to 160 acres, which is about 65 hectares, oh, there's a misspelling there, of land that had yet to be surveyed. So no one's gone out and made a map on that land. In theory, you could not preempt land that was a government reserve, including a reserve set aside for indigenous people, nor could you preempt land that was, quote, an Indian settlement. Although, as we'll see, that was never defined. It required forms of physical occupation. You have to be on the land for, for an extended period of time, and you also have to improve and cultivate the land. So it's very Lockean in that sense. You have to mix your labor with the land. And if you achieve all these things over a period of time, uh, if you pay a very small amount of money, um, you can get what's called a crown grant. In other words, the state, which in Canada is the crown, uh, grants you title to that land. Now, preemption uh, was in place in British Columbia up until 1970. <clears throat> um, and it has been central to land dispossession in British Columbia and, in fact, in many other parts of the world, including the United States, particularly the Western United States. So large amounts of settler property in North America, or at least the US and Canada, derive from that original preemption claim. Now, as part of our work, we've been trying to understand the history behind preemption, both in a general sense, how it developed in the North American context, and also how it was developed in this part of the world where I live in Western Canada. The important point that I want to emphasize is that as far as we can tell, it was in many ways a colonial innovation that derived from older European legal concepts, but was transformed in this colonial uh, space. And this I think is interesting because it echoes important scholarship being done by other um, researchers, other workers influenced by the world, the um, uh, by working what's called racial capitalism, who have also been tracing the way in which many property doctrines, legal doctrines like mortgage foreclosure, for example, were actually produced through colonial uh, encounters. Now, the doctrine of preemption appears across many different legal fields and legal systems. I would be interested to know the degree to which it applies within the uh, civil law and the Latin American context. But the basic idea of preemption in the realm of property is that it gives an individual the right of what's called first refusal over land that is being sold or alienated. They get first in the queue. The doctrine of preemption, as it appears in the colonial context, has its origins in international law not property, however. It was used to give one European state the right to claim foreign territory as against... Solicitar, por supuesto, tierras extendas? As against uh, another European state. Is everything okay? Todo está bien? Hello? 
Hola. Hello. I'm going to. I'm just making sure that everything is okay, and um. I will assume it is and carry on. Okay. Um, <laughs> so historically then, preemption was used by states to settle disputes between European powers over colonial territory. But it was then, as it's called, domesticated in the United States and Canada. It gets taken up inside these new settler states and is now used to allow settlers, not states, to gain rights over indigenous lands. So in the colonial context, in other words, it became reframed as a, as a private right that is granted to a person, quote, who has taken possession of that which has no prior possessor, unquote. So it moves from the, the law of states to private law, allowing for the privatization of land claimed by the colonial state. And this is a really interesting and important shift in direction that is worth noting, particularly given the argument that we're gonna make that actually dispossession wasn't purely private, but was always shaped by law in many, many ways. Now, preemption's history in colonial British Columbia, the way it was taken up in this part of the world is also something that we're trying to make sense of. <clears throat> Essentially, it was a political compromise, a compromise between competing colonial imperatives. Colonial authorities in the 1860s were, of course, keen to have an orderly process for the allocation of land that they regarded now as their own. Indigenous land was reimagined as essentially state land or crown land. But to do so in a way that would encourage productive use, in particular agriculture, rather than land speculation. This was something they were worried about. Now, British Columbia occupies a very large, a vast mountainous terrain. It's larger than Chile, um, uh, almost a million uh, um, acres. Surveying, land surveying, was required for land sales because people are only going to buy land if they know their, the portion of those land, but surveying was difficult, it was slow, and it was very expensive. And so as a consequence, settlers pushed very hard to make land accessible before surveying had actually happened. And the images you see on the screen here are newspaper clippings from the early, uh, the middle years of the 19th century in which settlers are organizing and pressuring the authorities to make land available. Borrowing from the model that was being developed in the United States, particularly in the Western parts of the United States, colonial authorities in British Columbia began developing a policy that would allow settlers to do what we've just said, to preempt land that had yet to be surveyed. And while this was supposedly driven by the state, the practice in reality, as we'll see, was that it gave settlers remarkable discretion on the ground. We'll come back to that in a minute. But let's just think a little bit more about preemption uh, more generally. Now, preemption tends not to be talked about very much. It's, it's, it's a curious gap in terms of scholarship. Uh, if it is talked about, it's actually talked about in a sort of nostalgic frame. This is a newspaper or a magazine article from a, an American magazine called The Atlantic. And it describes an American, a modern day American woman called Shay Elliott who engages in homesteading. And homesteading is very similar to, to preemption. Uh, and homesteading in particular has a very nostalgic inflection in, uh, in uh, popular discourse, particularly uh, discourse in uh, North America. Shay Elliott apparently is attracted to homesteading because she likes, quote, drawing on and learning things of the past, like the 19th century homesteaders who traveled into the Wild West on covered wagons, uh, fending off Indians. The, uh, she, she churns butter, she stocks her larder before winter, she treats illnesses with herbs while Instagramming her lifestyle um, uh, aggressively. This is an image I found uh, actually about homesteading in Colombia. Uh, so it would seem that homesteading 
uh, at least is um, attractive in Colombian, although whether this is uh, Colombian people or more likely Americans coming down looking for cheap land is something we can talk about. So homesteading in this context has this nostalgic um, uh, gloss upon it. But of course, there's a very selective learning that's going on here. Um, the myths around homesteading gloss over its racialized history, including its violence, which we'll explain in a minute, as well as ignoring the continued relevance of homesteading and preemption to contemporary colonialism. Huge amounts of land rest on these logics of homesteading and uh, colonialism. Now, there isn't a lot of scholarship on preemption. Uh, many have written about uh, things like terra nullius uh, or the doctrine of discovery, but preemption as a landlord doctrine, as a, as a key vehicle for land dispossession, um, hasn't really received the attention that I, we think it deserves. There's very little critical research on Canada, in, on Canadian preemption. There is some scholarship in the United States, however, exploring the practice of land occupation and squatting practiced by settlers as they moved into what was called Indian country, land that was supposedly unavailable for settler um, land acquisition. Uh, so moving into Indian country in violation of the state rule of state rules. Now, while some of this work, uh, some of this has received uh, a powerful critique, the work of Robert Nichols or K. Sue Park uh, in particular. Others actually have a surprisingly positive take on um, homesteading and squatting. Hernando de Soto in his book, The Mystery of Capital, uh, and Eduardo Peñalva and uh, Sonia Cachiel, who are American um, legal academics, point to the ways in which the illegal practices of these land squatters engaged in forms of homesteading before homesteading is permitted, actually facilitated subsequent improvements in property law. So out of this, homesteading actually develops in a more formal sense. So preemption in these cases is, is sort of standing in for something else. It's being used to make a broader argument about property innovation, about the mystery of capital uh, in the case of De Soto. But we want to, however, treat it more on its own terms, understanding its fundamentally violent and racist logic. Uh, also, I think it's worth noting that in this literature, law is described as catching up to the, these illegal practices of squatting. Now, this may be relevant in the American context, but certainly in the Canadian case, we want to suggest a different narrative rather than law catching up with illegal practices. Law was there from the beginning in important and consequential ways. So preemption law in British Columbia was highly legalized. There were multiple acts and then there were subsequent modifications to the exact practices that preemptors were supposed to engage with in order to achieve Crown Grant, the title at the end of the day. How then is it possible to make sense of the apparently illegal practices we described at the beginning, the case of Billy Clark and Indian Isaac? More generally, how can we think about the relationship between law and non-law or illegality? And here, I think, here's my connection to the city. Uh, here we can learn from urbanists writing in and on the cities of the global south. Southern urbanism has uh, a really very interesting set of ideas that I think we can bring to bear. Now, liberal legality, of course, relies on this sharp divide between that which is law and that which is not law, or that which is outside law. But what Southern urbanists ask us to do is to question this divide, particularly in their treatment of the informal sector or informality, things like squatting, uh, for example. Informality, of course, is a sector of urban life that takes place supposedly without state oversight, supposedly without legal regulation, formal control. But informality, the urbanists tell us, should not be thought of as something simply outside law, but something that is in some ways produced through differentiated forms of late state and legal action. 
Informality is practiced by the rich and by the poor. Squat squatter settlements exist next to upscale housing, both of them in violation of prevailing planning and zoning law. Both forms of housing are informal, yet one becomes retroactively legitimized by the state, the upscale housing, while the other, the squatter settlement, is not. So rather than being the antithesis or the opposition to law, informality therefore is produced by the state through a process in which certain valorized practices are regularized, are formalized, while others are marginalized and delegitimized. The Indian scholar Gautam Ban writes about this very well when he talks about the ways in which we must, quote, understand and account for the differentiated implications of various illegalities when exercised by different urban actors. It becomes useful to trace how the boundaries of law are socially differentiated through the negotiation of relative value. Some people's formal practices or informal practices are differently valorized by state and by law. The production of informality therefore becomes a quote site in and through which social hierarchies are reproduced and negotiated. Perhaps then we can begin to think slightly differently about preemption law and the positions of Indian Isaac and Billy Clark standing in for all those other uh, settlers and all those other indigenous people in engaged in these violent encounters. I think it becomes possible, drawing from what we've just said, to begin to think through the ways in which preemption law makes possible the very different legal positions of Indian Isaac and Billy Clark. Property law does this through devaluing Indian Isaac and his relationship to land while valorizing and empowering Billy Clark. The burning of Isaac's home is a direct consequence of law, in other words, not an exception from it. Now to explain this, we're gonna introduce quickly two subjects, two legal subjects, the deputy and the outlaw. And note the role of law in creating these positions through the process of deputization and outlawry. Now, I was trying to think through ways in which to communicate these concepts. Um, and so what I'm gonna do is draw from Hollywood uh, as a cultural reference point. We'll then move quickly away from Hollywood, but basically I think we've all seen enough Hollywood cowboy movies to have a rough idea or a rough sense of these two figures, the deputy and the outlaw. A deputy is somebody like this person in the left who has been appointed or deputized by a lawman or a sheriff. So the sheriff says, we have to arrest some criminals. Uh, they find a member of the public and they deputize them. They put a badge on them. Uh, and then that person then has the, the powers similar to the sheriff. An outlaw, of course, is somebody like Billy the Kid in the right, somebody who has broken the law and is to be brought to justice before the law, whether they're dead or alive. Now let's quickly move away from Hollywood. Um, but spend a bit more time on these concepts of the deputy and the outlaw and their relevance to, to preemption. Now, I should make clear that in my conversations with, uh, with uh, Brenner, Banda, um, we're more comfortable with the idea of the deputy and we're not still quite comfortable with the notion of the outlaw as it applies here. Uh, but I'm gonna try it out anyway, and you can tell me um, whether you find it persuasive or not. So let's begin with the deputy and let's begin by thinking about deputization, but I'm gonna to go to a very different place uh, altogether. And the quote here comes from a phenomenal geographer, a black geographer called Ruth Wilson Gilmore um, from the United States. And what she's describing in this quotation, which I'll unpack in a minute, is the shooting of a black man, an African-American man called George Floyd. And George Floyd was murdered by the Minneapolis police in the United States. Now George Floyd had gone to a convenience store in Minneapolis to buy cigarettes. A store worker, however, worried that the money was, was a forgery, was fake. As a consequence, 
the store worker chose to call the police. That then led to a cascading series of events, the outcome of which was the murder of Floyd by the police. The thing that set in motion, as Ruth Wilson Gilmore puts it, that sets in motion the events that resulted in Mr. Floyd's brutal murder was that an employee at a convenience store thought that they had handed, been handed a counterfeit bill. Now this young person, and she assumes it's a good person, uh, working for a good, a good employer, did their job to keep their job. But then she asked this really interesting and important question. We have to ask ourselves, why couldn't it be that they take the money, complete the transaction, and then deal with it afterwards? Why did they have to call the police? She says they call the police because they've been deputized. They, they are, in a sense, acting as if they were a deputy police officer. And she wants to make an argument about the way in which racism works within the policing system more generally, such that more and more of us become deputized by the police, acting as if it were as extensions of the police more generally. But I'm going to use this in the different context of preemption law and take this, I think, very rich notion of deputization here um, uh, and, and bring it forward. Now, so to be deputized refers to a process whereby uh, the police officer gives informally, in this case, or formally, some of their powers to civilians, to non-police officers. So non-legal actors now become legal actors. If you're deputized, you can take on some of the powers of the law official. A deputy enforces law. They make judgments regarding how and when to enforce law. They're empowered to use force, including bodily violence. Now, when we think about preemption policy, our argument is that it deputizes white settlers in several interlocking ways. It gives them powers, legal powers, despite the way in theory it actually controls their powers. In reality, it actually extends those powers in creative ways, the effect of which is actually ultimately uh, often violence, settler violence. And this is fundamentally because it's highly discretionary. It empowers the settler to make a whole series of legal judgments on the ground um, as they move forward over time. The effect of this is to make the settler a lawmaker themselves. They have the power effectively to make property on the ground. Now, property is, of course, not just about a person's relationship to land. It's also, by definition, about relations to others. So deputization also has the effect of facilitating forms of violence against those who are imagined now to be non-owners, Indigenous people in particular. So most immediately, preemption applies to unsurveyed land. This land has yet to be mapped out by a state official. So this means that the settler can go to land, often remote land, like in Bulkley Lake, and make decisions about which land to claim. Deputization in this sense entails powers of territorialization, the power to make and remake territory. And in so doing, of course, by drawing lines, by driving stakes into the ground, to make and to remake property forcibly converting indigenous lands into settler property. That discretionary power is important. Even commentators at the time were struck by the kind of flexibility this gave the settler. So there's a quote here in the slide from a newspaper uh, in 1861, in which the preemptor is described as wandering through the woods until he finds a piece of land that suits his fancy and then driving stakes into the ground. Now, there were constraints, we've noted already. One of those is that you can't preempt land upon which there is an Indian settlement. But crucially, this was never defined. In other words, it's up to the settler to decide, is that an Indian settlement? Or maybe not. And we're going to come back to this point uh, in a minute. Uh, Preemption policy, in theory, required strict compliance with a series of detailed rules, but in reality, 
uh, like settlers have to stay on the land, they have to cultivate the land and so on. But in practice, the state relied on the preemptor reporting their compliance with these rules to distant authorities, many, many miles away, who provided very limited oversight over the processes because there was a very limited uh, state apparatus in oper operation at the time. This has the effect of making the preemptor effectively legally autonomous. They have, in a sense, the power to self-govern themselves, the degree to which they're abiding by these own rules, interpreting those rules, not surprisingly, in ways that tended to work for them. So as we noted, this has the effect of allowing settlers, this deputization process has the effect of allowing settlers to carve out territory from indigenous land. But territory and property are also about enforcement. They're about mobilizing force when needed. And preemption law, and this is interesting, empowered settlers by giving them certain propriety, proprietary rights. In other words, they have the rights in many cases of the person who actually has full title to the land, the power to use trespass against somebody uh, on their land. So even before they have full title, they can enforce property rights even before becoming full rights holders. They were also required to improve the land, to cultivate the land. This also, of course, incentivizes them to expel others, including notably indigenous people. And it's basically only indigenous people who are on the land at the time. So law thus directly and indirectly deputizes and thus empowers the settler. It gives them powers to perform private property, even though they don't have private property. It does this through its absence. It's not there. Or it does it by empowering uh, settlers through discretionary powers, allowing settlers to make law-like decisions. This can be remarkable, remarkably effective uh, on the ground. In so doing, the state as a deputy becomes an extension of the state, not just an actor engaged in law-like practices. So here we can borrow from Judith Butler, who talks about the idea of the petty sovereign. A petty sovereign is, is a mini sovereign, if you like, a deputy. Butler writes about this in the context of the suspension of law, in the absence of law, but here the settler becomes a deputized extension of the law, solidifying the sovereign power of a very thinly stretched settler state. They are the state, um, even at a very dis distant remove from the official centers of state power. This means that they're able to resettle land in a expedient and timely manner. But in so doing, they also become enforcers of a new set of colonial logics, the enforcers of, if you like, colonial territory, because they now have these proprietary powers, the powers to expel, the powers to draw a line on the ground. The historical geographer Cole Harris talked about the importance of this, the, the role of uh, non-state officials, settlers, enforcing this new sets of colonial logics of, um, uh, of settler property uh, against indigenous people. It's not state officials who are doing this, it's settlers, settlers with property entitlements, with leases, with uh, preemption claims. They're monitoring, they're watching indigenous people as they move across their land, land that is now reimagined as settler land. Such watching, as Harris put it, backed by the law, turned native people into trespassers. It defined where they could go and could not go. Now, crucially, Oh, sorry, I want to, this, this speaks to the kind of informality, if you will, of this process. And these are uh, preemption applications from settlers in the early 1870s, 1890s. Uh, and you were required to uh, send a, a two page document in, in which you said, this is roughly where it is. It's about this size. And then because it's unsurveyed, you draw a line on a map, literally the back of an envelope in which you said, this is the land I'm applying for. And as Harris puts it, these few lines scratched on a page because of the way they feed into colonial logics and preemption policy, facilitate this magic of colonial land dispossession in a striking way. 
Now, deputization is racialized. Preemption is formally unavailable to indigenous people. Only white people get to be deputies of preemption. This is from one of the acts at the time, as you can see, it applies to a British subject who was effectively a white person uh, and uh, preemption, except in very, 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 very rare and effectively vanishingly rare cases, shall not apply to any of the so-called Aborigines or indigenous people of this continent. Preemption is also racialized, of course, because it's predicated on racialized notions of improvement and use. To be a, to be a preemptor required conformity with settler enactments of property and cultivation. The power to re-territorialize, the power of the deputy, is also directed at indigenous people and their land. You can't preempt land that is occupied by another settler. It has to be, quote, unoccupied land, that is land that is effectively indigenous. So, that's the deputy and deputized power. Now let me move to the outlaw. And as I said, we have some debates about this still. So what's an outlaw? As we said, the short answer to that is an outlaw is a person who has broken the law. They are literally in a space outside law. But this is technically inaccurate. An outlaw is not simply in a space outside or in opposition to law, like the deputy, outlaw status is legally produced. Outlaws are made by law. And here we need to understand the idea of outlawry, or the legal designation of outlaw status. Now, outlawry is very old in European law. You can find precedents in Greek law, in Roman law. It was taken up by Germanic and Scandinavian legal systems. Essentially, it's a form of legal expulsion targeted against those who are deemed to be threats to the collective or to the rule of the king. Once outlawed, a person becomes a new legal category, a person who is stripped of legal protection and is subject to the violences of others. So in Icelandic law, for example, someone who was declared an outlaw lost the rights accorded to members of the community, the right to own property included, they were exiled for life, they were stripped of legal protection, and they were treated as though they were, legally speaking, dead. Now, outlaw status is a product of law. In the English common law, it came with a proclamation. Caput gerat lupinum, may he bear the wolf's head. This idea that the outlaw now is like the wolf. Deprived of legal protection, the outlaw, like the wolf, could be killed with Im immunity, impunity, sorry, by another, a non-outlaw. Indeed, non-outlaws were obliged to subjugate the outlaw in the same way that they were obliged to kill the wolf. So outlawry, therefore, entails a sort of legal relegation in which a person is placed in a condition of heightened vulnerability, while the lawful are provided legal immunity to dominate the outlaw. This isn't a state of legal abandonment, because law is clearly operative here. It's not a space simply of unlawfulness. Outlaw status is legally produced and legally reg regulated. Outlaw is clearly tied to a set of understandings about worth, membership, and standing, which can very quickly and very easily become racialized in all sorts of ways. It's also spatialized because the outlaw is imagined as living in outlaw zones, outlaw spaces, liminal, uh, uh, transgressive spaces. Now, one of the questions, and we're struggling with this, <laughs> is the degree to which outlawry is a concept that's useful in understanding the status to which the legal status assigned to indigenous people under colonial law. The degree to which it makes sense to think about them as effectively outlawed by property law. This is still up for debate, but I think fundamentally the argument is that in the status of the indigenous person is profoundly legally, re legally regulated and legally constituted, however defined, which places them in a space of vulnerability, explaining the sorts of violences um, that could be visited upon them by the deputized Billy Clark. Outlaws, like indigenous people, are forced into a space of legal relegation. They're imagined as outside the space of settler law, 
They're imagined as a threat to settler notions of property and sovereignty. Uh, this clearly entails a racial devaluation of their personhood. Um, like the outlaw, they've been stripped of their rights to land. Interestingly, as we noted, they are expressly forbidden to preempt land. Um, and like the classical outlaw, they also, in a sense, bear the wolf's head. Although others are not required to subjugate them in the way that the outlaw classically is, the presumption that they have no rights to their land except tiny reserves. This is a map showing reserve land uh, um, in the early years of the 20th century. It's the same geography now. The presumption that indigenous people have no rights to land mean that the relation, their relationship to land and to culture is to be destroyed. It doesn't count. Their land is reimagined as crown land, as state land that can and should be transferred to white settlers. So there's a, a violence, I think, that's tied fundamentally to their relegated legal status. It's in these terms, perhaps, perhaps, that we can begin to understand the violent encounter between Clark and Isaac. And I'm now coming to a close. Because Clark has been deputized, as it were, by property law, he has the legal ability to carve private property out of indigenous lands. Isaac's relegation, his outlawry, sees his rights to the land being denied. His land becomes crown land that Clark can claim as his own. Indian Isaac, from Clark's perspective, was trespassing on Clark's land. Clark had the powers, he had the duty, he had the requirement to expel trespassers. Now, settlers were not supposed to preempt land where there was a, quote, Indian settlement, as we noted earlier, but this was never defined. So why the destruction of these houses is one of the questions we're grapple, grappling with. And arguably, the threat that an indigenous house posed to Clark's settler claims required that it be destroyed. The house was a target. It had to be removed such that there was no Indian settlement on the land. Clark makes waste in destroying Isaac's house. Now, waste in English has two meanings here. The first is a Lockean sense, in the sense of the writings of John Locke. By burning Isaac's house down, by expelling Isaac and his family, Clark makes the land into waste in the sense that John Locke would understand it. Waste in this sense is land that is unused, land that is empty, land that is available for cultivation by the rational and the industrious and rational white man. But to do so requires that Clark lays waste to Isaac's home and family in the second sense. To lay waste refers to the process of destruction, of retribution, and violence, you lay waste to an enemy and their lands. It's also in this light, I think, that we can understand Agent Loring's recognition that there will be no justice for Indian Isaac. He will have to wait forever. Land becomes property, when the scholar Saito puts it, when lived on by some people, but not by others. Speaking to the legal, illegal, formal, informal, we discussed earlier. Without whiteness, it is not property. Put another way, the deputized, because they are deputies, are protected. Their lands are to be protected. As a result, the illegal becomes regularized and formalized. Now, this is Billy Clark and the story of Indian Isaac are from more than 100 years ago. But my point here is that preemption and the practices of racialized deputization and relegation or outlawry cast a long shadow in the colonial society that I live in. Many colonial land titles now can trace themselves back directly to Billy Clark and the violences of a hundred years ago. Edward Said said that dispossession is not a very pleasant thing when you look at it closely and I think looking at it closely reveals some very unpleasant things. And this comes close to home. The home that I live in, the home that I'm talking to you from right now, 
can also be traced back to a preemption in 1884. The image on the screen is the Crown Grant from 1884, where the land was transferred to somebody called George Henry Howison through what I understand to be preemption. So my entitlement to this land as a settler, as a non-Indigenous people, can be tied directly back to those racialized practices. But there's a, perhaps also a more immediate point of connection. Private property more generally has been likened to a sort of sovereignty. Private property not only requires that the state sanction it and recognize it, it also, of course, enables the owner to exercise forms of power. They can become like a little sovereign, like a little king or a petty sovereign. Now this argument, broadly speaking, was used by an American legal realist called Morris Cohen in the 1920s in a very famous paper called Sovereign's Property and Sovereignty, in which he challenges the distinction between um, uh, public and private law, where sovereignty is something exclusively to the state, noting the ways in which um, sovereignty can also be found in the so-called private, in private law. He wanted to challenge, as a realist, he wanted to challenge the myth of property as purely private. He wanted us to see the reality of property. Property as a form of sovereignty means, Cohen pointed out, that dominion over things is imperium or rule over other people. And that's an important point as far as it goes, but I think we need to take it that much further, recognizing in the colonial context that um, as a private property owner, I'm not just a little sovereign. I've also been deputized by these colonial logics. An owner of unceded indigenous land, I too am a petty sovereign, enforcing colonial territoriality and sustaining the world France Fanon described of as one, quote, divided into compartments, a world cut into two. Thank you very much. Um, I hope that was useful. Now I will stop sharing and um, Muchas gracias, eh, Nick. Muchas gracias por la, la presentación eh, llena de ideas muy interesantes, pero también útiles para pensar la la relación entre los pueblos indígenas y las tierras urbanas y, y, y no urbanas, que es cierto que estamos pensando en este seminario. Voy a tratar de hablar más lento. En este seminario, para la traducción, en este seminario tenemos una gran variedad de ponencias, las de esta mañana y las que todavía vienen. Eh, y pensamos que el, el valor de este seminario es justamente poner el enfoque en la propiedad. Una cosa que muchas veces no lo hacemos, no, no hacemos ese esfuerzo pensando que la propiedad simplemente es algo que no tienen los pueblos indígenas. Creo que estas ideas son bastante útiles, eh, esta idea del preemption, ¿cierto? el derecho preferente de compra, este mecanismo muy particular que funcionó en, la, en lo que llegaría a ser Canadá, pero también esta idea del delegado del sheriff eh, versus el forajido, ¿cierto? el outlaw, el fuera de la ley. Eh, esto del delegado como pequeño soberano, el forajido al margen de la ley, el caput Gerard Lopino, nunca lo había escuchado, eh, pero esta idea de la discreción ¿cierto? en la aplicación de las leyes, la territorialización de la propiedad, pero pienso que quizá para mí lo central está en esta diferencia racial en la definición de la propiedad cuando eh, es algo quizá muy simple, pero no, no lo había tomado en cuenta, cuando dijo sin blancura, o whiteness, ¿cierto? Sin, eh, sin que la persona fuese blanco, eh, si la persona no es blanca o, o sin blancura, no hay propiedad. Es muy interesante. Un, una tierra, eh, el hecho de, de ser indígena o blanco hace una diferencia para la, la forma como la persona puede acceder a los mecanismos de, de, ¿cierto? de, de legal, legalidad frente al Estado. Eh, así que, bueno, y perdón, ahí volviendo a esa idea, yo creo que eso, esta idea tan aparentemente tan simple, después se territorializa, ¿cierto? 
eh, eh, y crean los territorios nacionales que, que estamos, con los cuales estamos trabajando hoy día en su, sus calidades. Me detengo eh, para abrir el micrófono, claramente me, me interesa mucho el tema, eh, pero abro el micrófono para preguntas, si hay más comentarios, más preguntas. No sé si está el... Antes había como un video chiquitito de Blomley, ¿no? No se puede... Ah, no se puede juntar, quizás. No sé cómo... Ah, ahí estamos, ahí está, ya, listo. Entonces, no sé si hay... Sí, yo creo que, creo que eso fue un saludo. Creo que aquí la... Catherine quería hacer una pregunta. Sí, quería hacerte una pregunta. Y es eh, por la... Si viste algo eh, en tu trabajo sobre la relación de pronto con las mujeres y la posibilidad de ver, eh, bueno, la tierra también. Eh, con, como ese vínculo para, pues para las poblaciones indígenas también, una imposición marcada por la, la vía de, de los hombres que podrían heredar la tierra. Eh, quería preguntarte eso, como la posibilidad de ver cómo viste la relación de las mujeres con la tierra. Thank you. I I think I got the translation to that question. Um, uh, the relationship between women and land uh, in the uh, and property in this uh, in this project. Thank you very much for asking that very very important question. Um, the um, obviously the process, as you can see, of land preemption is inherently patriarchal because it presumes the man or the widow um, uh, as as the the active agents of uh, of cultivation and um, and uh, uh, land preemption. Um, uh, so I think that speaks to to a particular gendered logic of, of property. Uh, property is not just about whiteness; it's also about masculinity, um, which is crucial to the uh, to the story. It's also uh, important um, in terms of the the counter narratives because um, the the testimony that I described from this commission, um, although it's incredibly powerful because it's one of these few moments in which you see indigenous people actually speaking back to the state um, at this time, is driven by men. It's it's so the the people who are told to speak before the commission are are men. Uh, they're they're the uh, the chiefs, uh, the male chiefs. Um, which is a denial of the political institutions actually operative in uh, many of these indigenous cultures. Many of them are matriarchal, where women play a very central and important role. But of course, the state, the colonial state, sees the man uh, and sees male priorities, and that is reflected in the testimony. Um, there is, however, some very important testimony, um, which uh, we've been working with, which speaks to uh, settlers destroying land or expelling land over which women have property rights because women, women um, traditionally have particular relationships to land that differ from men. Um, so you see moments in the archive where women's stories and perspectives are actually made more visible, but then again, they're, they're closed up uh, in important ways. Um, But a more generally, I think, speaking to, to, to gender in, in this analysis, rather than focusing on race, would be an important inflection in the story um, as we move forward. So thank you very much for, the, for that question. Muchas gracias por la respuesta. Hay un comentario en eh, Zoom, no tengo el, el autor, pero dice el régimen jurídico sostiene a la propiedad en los países de la tradición continental europea. Es una forma positiva, una positiva. Una positiva. que el seniana muy dura. En, no es una pregunta, es como un, un comentario. Y hay eh, otro comentario de Volker. Sí, no sé, no, no veo otra... 
Hay un comentario, una pregunta ahora. Sí. Ah, gracias. Ya, ahora sí. Termina ahora con una pregunta. En el caso del Common Law, eh, ah, perdón, esto es del profesor Volter Alvarado, aquí de la facultad. En el caso del Common Law, o de la, del derecho común, ¿resulta flexible instalar regímenes diferenciales de propiedad, entendiendo que la tradición colonial prefig prefigura lo civilizado desde la propiedad en sí? No sé si se pudo traducir. Cuesta un poco, eh, bastante densa la pregunta. Voy a repetir. En el caso del Common Law, ¿resulta flexible instalar regímenes diferenciales de propiedad, entendiendo que la tradición colonial prefigura lo, lo civilizado desde la propiedad en sí? Y nos avisa Voltaire que está con COVID, así que no puede participar en él. El... ¿Sí? Ahora... Um, I think I think I I got some of that and and maybe um, maybe I could get some more help on that. So I understand the question relates to common law versus civil law. Um, common law traditionally is more flexible in its approach as compared to to civil law. Um, I believe that was the emphasis, but I'm not sure what the question the question is there in regards to that. I'm sorry. Um, This is, we're moving between common law and civil law. Now we're moving between Spanish and English. So uh, <laughs> if there was some more clarity on that, I can, I can address it, I try to. Sí, también entiendo que hay una diferencia entre eh, el derecho continental europeo, que es muy positiva, muy dura, ¿Cierto? Exactamente. Y el common law inglés, ¿cierto? El, el derecho común es muy flexible. Mm -hmm. o sea, se entiende que es más flexible. Entonces la pregunta es, si cree que el, el common law es más flexible para instalar estos regímenes diferenciales de propiedad. Uh, ok, that's a... That's a very large question, um, and I'm not a, a I'm not an expert in civil law um, or a comparative law scholar. Um, uh, so I can't speak directly to that question. I would um, maybe others can speak, have more insights uh, to it. I mean, I think what's interesting with the preemption policy, although, uh, well, there's flexibility and 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 non-flexibility at the same time i think that's what's interesting one is a, a change in the doctrine so a change in the way in which preemption is understood uh, as it moves from its traditional european international law domain to the domain of private law and i i don't know whether civil law has that flexibility that would be an interesting question but i think what's also interesting is that the the doctrine itself as it's applied is actually quite Is, is theoretically non-flexible. <laughs> it's actually very strict. I mean, there are all sorts of strict rules. Obviously, the govern the authorities are trying to, to see like a state, if we can use that phrase, to manage these preemptors on the ground um, and giving them very, very strict rules about how many stakes they have to put in the ground. Yet at the same time, it, it built into that is this discretion and flexibility. So, so maybe the distinction between flexibility and non-flexibility is something we also need to challenge. That wasn't a very direct answer, um, um, but um, uh, it's the best I can do under the circumstances. Thank you. No, yo creo que es eh, justamente es un tema bastante amplio para entender esta, esta flexibilidad. Como usted dice, la, hay una cierta rigidez que, que lo ven ahí en, en el contexto canadiense, ven como algo rígido que después se aplica de forma flexible. Eh, ahí habría, faltaría más estudios, para eso podemos proponer algunos estudios comparados, ¿no es cierto? Eh, pero, pero acá en el... Nuestra tradición acá en Sudamérica sentimos que 
siempre la, la, el análisis es que la ley es muy dura, es muy positiva, es muy, eh, muy poco flexible. Eh, pero yo intuyo, sin, sin, entender, sin conocer en profundidad la pregunta, que justamente eh, acaba a pasar al revés. La ley es muy dura, pero la, la eh, aplicación es muy flexible también. Pienso que va a ser algo parecido, pero eso lo dejamos para el, el proyecto conjunto. ¿Alguna, ¿Alguna otra pregunta? Sí. Aquí adelante que la cordón es cortito. Me llamo Fabiola. <risa> Ay, qué bueno. Eh, soy de Chuquicamata, pero estoy viviendo hace cinco años acá en Concepción y me titulé este año de arquitectura acá. Y mi pregunta va más a las relaciones del de derecho a la propiedad respecto a que, viendo el sistema actual en el que se ejerce la propiedad en Chile y bueno, en todo el mundo, ¿cómo podríamos retribuir a los pueblos originarios este derecho a la propiedad? Porque este mismo concepto del derecho a la propiedad vendría a dar o a preestablecer o a continuar esta lógica colonial, ¿cómo realmente podríamos darle un, un sentido a los pueblos originarios para que puedan establecer esta propiedad? Thank you, Fabiana. I'm, I'm, I'm actually I'm getting two translators uh, speaking to me in English, which which I'm, is very generous. But um, it, um, uh, I'm getting two simultaneous English translations, so it's a little um, so it's like hearing in stereo. Um, but so what I Fabiella, thank you. What I understood you to be saying is that you're interested in uh, in the system in in Chile uh, regarding the ways in which indigenous people can claim rights to their uh, to their land. Um, I hope that's that's correct, um, and the degree to which that might also uh, reflect certain continuing colonial logics. Um, that's a, and I think that's a very. Yeah, I hope that's correct, and if it's not, then please please do let me know. Um, uh, that's a very interesting dynamic. I wouldn't be surprised if there is not some continuing colonial uh, logic. Um, this has been an issue in um, in other places as well. Uh, what how if we allow indigenous people, <laughs> as we should, uh, to have some recognized relationship to the land, what should that look like? Exactly what should that look like? Um, and and uh, how should that um, translate into other relationships to land? Um, I think that's a fundamental question. Um, and in part, it's a technical question, but it's also, I think, a, a moral and political question that carefully needs uh, thought, uh, in particular, the advice of indigenous people themselves. One temptation, um, and this is, for example, the De Soto logic, um, De Soto, Hernando De Soto has made this argument expressly, as well as others, is, well, obviously, what indigenous people need is they need fee simple title. They need the sort of property uh, that you find in uh, in the U.S. in the West, um, in the, the, the that is the mystery of capitalism. That's basically his argument, um, and so that has driven. So De Soto has come. He came some years ago. I remember to Vancouver, um, and to talk to Indigenous people to explain to them why this was why this was so needed. And there were in fact some Indigenous people who came as well, because Indigenous people do not have a legally recognized relationship to their land uh, in in Canada. Um, they clearly have their own understanding, but, but the degree to which that is recognized or comports within a larger legal frame is hard to follow. But what was interesting was that many, many indigenous people said, no, that is exactly what we do not want. We do not want be simple title um, for a whole variety of reasons. Some of them uh, having to do with, uh, with, um, uh, with a concern about, about markets, that this facilitates commodification. It opens up markets it monetizes indigenous lands uh, in ways that threaten that land base and threaten a relationship which is, which is predicated on many generations before and many ge generations going forward. Um, others are more pragmatic in that understanding. Um, so there are differences. There is no one indigenous 
voice, I think, um, at play here. There needs to be different understandings as there are different indigenous relationships to land in Chile and in different parts of Chile as there would be in, in, uh, in Canada. Um, so it's a very, very important and pressing and pressing question that uh, I think needs careful attention. Thank you very much for that. Alguna pregunta más? Quizá aprovechando para meter la cuchara eh, en este en esta pregunta me estaba acordando de un artículo suyo del de 2014 2015 sobre procesos de los tratados eh, en Canadá y cómo eh, el gobierno canadiense, si entendí bien el artículo, el gobierno canadiense insistió siempre en eh, darle tierra en propiedad, eh, eh, en derecho pleno, digamos, en, cierto, en propiedad absoluta, digamos, a los, a los pueblos indígenas, de Cana pueblos originarios de Canadá, mientras que los abogados eh, insistían en que era, era más complejo, había que hacer algo más. No era suficiente decir ya ustedes tienen propiedad, sus tierras en propiedad para que la puedan comp eh, comprar, o sea, vender, comprar, enajenar, etcétera, sino que insistían, por lo que entendí, eh, eh, insistían que no, era más complejo. Habían otras relaciones sociales imbricadas en esa propiedad. La propiedad no podía ser algo tan simple, tan mercantilizada, eh, por lo que entendí. No sé si quizá puede hablar un poco más de esa, de esa idea, si... Si nos puede contar un poco más. Yes, thank you very much for that, uh, for that uh, case. This was a project I was engaged in some years ago. Um, in British Columbia, it's unusual because unlike other parts of Canada, there were no, with a very few exceptions, there were no treaties signed between colonial set, colonial authorities and indigenous people. It was a sort of dis terra nullius logic that this was there was no relationship to the land therefore there was no need for a treaty uh, and only recently um, were was there a recognition that this was an unresolved question that needed to be addressed and so a, a modern day treaty process was created um, which which led to many of the questions that um, uh, was just was just outlined the crucial question or one of the crucial questions was okay we're going to have a treaty between the indigenous people and the, and the state. Um, and as part of that, the indigenous people are gonna get some of their land, a very small portion, some of their land back. Um, how then will the indigenous people own their land? What will the, be the nature of the relationship legally between the indigenous people and, and their land? And what's interesting is that this process, which is deeply political, deeply ethical, becomes immediately a very legal question. So there are lawyers on both sides, lawyers for the state and indigenous lawyers agonizing about this relationship. And the argument from the state was, well, what you need to have is like what everyone else has. You need to own your land in fee simple title. That's the common law term, which is the highest form of, of private property you can have. Um, and so they make a very technical argument, uh, assuming that this, technicality comes with no politics. Uh, it comes with no racialized history. It comes with no culture. But indigenous people, many of them at least, push back against that and say, um, in the same way that we have with preemption, property law is always inflected with moral, ethical, cultural understandings. It's not simply a black box of technicalities. It's always going to be uh, inflected. And in the colonial context, it's going to be racialized. You can't, you can't escape that. Um, and one of the things they pointed out uh, <laughs> appropriately was that their understanding of their relationship to the land was direct. It, the land and the nation are connected together uh, and tied together through a uh, long-standing connection um, that obviously predates the state, predates the colonial state, um, and is tied to a relationship to, to ancestors and to the spirits and the creator and so on. Um, 
The problem with fee simple title, they pointed out, was that this was a European English colonial context that had been transported to a settler context. And technically speaking, in fee simple title, you don't actually own your land. What you have is you have an interest in your land that has been given to you by the crown. And this comes from Norman England. This comes from 11th century England and feudal law. The idea that the, the crown owns all the land and then grants titles to individuals, including the fee simple title. So their argument was, well, why would we want the crown to give us back our land, land that we have a direct unmediated relationship to. Um, no, the lawyers for the state says, it's just a technicality. Don't worry about it. You know, hold your nose and, and carry on forward. But clearly I think this is an interesting moment because it speaks to the kind of racialized logics at work here and the way in which this process opened up that black box and revealed those dimensions. So thank you for the question. Muchas gracias por la, la respuesta. No sé si conocen un poco esa, esa lógica. Es muy diferente la, la lógica de en cada país. Por lo que he leído, esa es la figura, como dice Blomley, que viene de la, de la época medieval. Y entonces la corona es dueño, como el rey, excepto en su momento, la corona es dueño de todo el territorio y le deja como en casi una especie de, no sé, como arriendo o algo así, que se llama el interés, ¿cierto? El, el, el disfrute de la tierra que sigue siendo de la corona. Entonces, claro, produce estas situaciones un poco extrañas. Mauro tiene una pregunta. Ahí está. Ya. Buenas tardes, Nicolás. Eh, una reflexión y una pregunta. Eh, me llama la atención en la ponencia esto, del Prendiopchon. Eh, Probablemente que la lógica colonial incluso sea más allá de, de esta distinción entre lo cultural entre lo anglo y lo latino. Eh, la figura esta del colono que avanza y que también toma jurisprudencia y cartas como agente y que se convierte como en una fusión entre lo que el Estado le da, le propicia. Eh, acá en el sur de Chile sucedió lo mismo, básicamente. Eh, estamos hablando siglo XIX, siglo XX. La justicia fue ejercida por manos de colonos también. Eh, y es interesante cómo esta figura es la propiedad cuando Pinochet irrumpe, digamos, en el sur de Chile, es un proceso particular que es precisamente propietarizar a las comunidades indígenas. La manera de asimilación es vía la propiedad. Es un mecanismo que utiliza Pinochet en el sur de Chile. Y la represión y la justicia que se hace en devolución de tierras tiene que ver con colonos que toman las armas en sus manos y ejecutan gente, o etc. Entonces creo que después de 100 años, esa lógica se reproduce independiente de, no sé si quienes habrán estado atrás y han tenido estos parámetros eh, conceptuales, anglo, atrás o no, pero está esa figura. Eh, y muchas veces, y eso lo se ha discutido incluso dentro del mundo de Mapuche, está, está también esta reflexión, si lo que hay que reclamar es la propiedad o el territorio. Es una encrucijada un poco en esta misma lógica de por qué vamos a reclamar algo que es nuestro. Y ahí ha habido una bifurcación de caminos diversos, de parte de las comunidades y de parte del Estado. Y tal vez hay una pregunta nomás de, como de referencia, cómo es la expresión hoy actual de los conflictos en Canadá territoriales y cómo el Estado está expresando esta defensa o no defensa de esos procesos aparentemente pasados de colonización, o cómo la enfrenta con los procesos actuales al menos en el caso chileno, ese proceso de colonización hoy día no es la figura del colono, sino la figura de las empresas transnacionales que se instalan y también empiezan a establecer una nueva jurisprudencia y un accionar también en los territorios frente a eso. Si nos puede relatar un poco la experiencia de ella. Thank you very much. Um, uh, yes, I, I, I would be really interested to to try and think with you um, uh, about, about the transferability of these ideas to, to, uh, to Latin America and to the civil, uh, civil law 
context. Um, one of the problems in thinking about law is, is that there is no law, there are multiple laws, there are multiple legal universes and they don't always overlap uh, neatly. Um, but, but thinking about these connections, I think would be something that I would be really interested in, in doing. So learning about the, the Chilean context uh, is, 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 is really interesting. Um, in terms of the uh, Canadian context, um, colonialism is, uh, and this was the point I try to make at the end, colonialism is still an active project. It's not, it's not finished by, by any means. Uh, it's not finished, at, particularly because indigenous people continue to assert relationships to land um, and, and, and claims to land and push back against settler, uh, settler logics in many powerful and important ways. Um, and that is expressed in, um, well, one of the huge challenges or one of the huge areas of conflict has been around uh, resources, about, about oil, about carbon, um, and about pipelines. Pipelines in particular, the Chile, probably like British Columbia, is, you know, it's a resource economy in which the economy is really tied to moving distant resources, um, great many, many uh, kilometers to uh, in infrastructures that then have to be exported to global markets. Um, so in British Columbia, it's fish, it's lumber, it's minerals, uh, and also now energy or energy coming from other places. Those resources are, of course, on indigenous lands. Um, those lands are without a treaty. There's no resolution to those. Um, they continue to be uh, relations to those land continue to be asserted by indigenous people. And they have proved very successful actually in, in, uh, in challenging pipelines, in challenging the resource economy and contesting this dispersed geography of uh, the infrastructural geography of resource extraction. I'm a geographer. Uh, and so I think about these questions as well as thinking about, about the law. Um, you raised also a question about, should we be fighting for property or should we be fighting for land? And that's a really, that's a really interesting, uh, a really interesting question. One of the arguments that it, my indigenous friends tell me is that their relationship to land is not a property relationship. They would refuse the term property precisely because property is this Western concept that comes with a set of Western uh, colonial um, uh, dimensions that that cannot fail to capture or cannot capture rather uh, a relationship to land, a relationship that is that is uh, goes beyond uh, property. Um, so they would argue that they need to fight for land. You could argue, however, that if you want to fight for land, you also need to be fighting for property. You need to be fighting for the, the legal infrastructure um, uh, within and beyond uh, that, that um, gives meaning, uh, at least technical meaning to that uh, to that relationship. But that's, uh, that's another question for another day. Alguna pregunta más? Que es ahora eh, ir cerrando. Bueno, eh, muchas gracias Nick por el, por el tiempo, muchas gracias por conversar con nosotros, gracias por la paciencia con todos los defectos que, que surgen en estas, eh, estas empresas de traducción a, a distancia, estas conversas, no sé, como 5.000 kilómetros o algo así. Muchas gracias por compartir con nosotros y bueno, eh, esperamos verlo también en algún momento. Y, ah, sí, eh, ¿quieren una foto? ¿Cómo es eso? Pero no va a salir una foto. Que todos vengan para una foto. Bueno, entonces todos van a venir para una foto. <risa> bueno, pues. No sé si sale con... Ah, vamos a ponernos ahí al lado de allá. ¿Cómo es eso? ¿Aquí nomás? ¿Ya? Ok. Venga, venga, venga. Exacto. Exacto. Queremos tener una prueba de su presencia aquí en nuestro seminario. Así que... Esta es lo... Sí. Ahí está. Ahí está. O puede, sí, puede ser más allá. Sí. 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 O al ladito de allá. Sí. 
Muy bien. Muchas gracias. Adelante, adelante. Sí, sí. That's wonderful. That's so wonderful. Manuel, ¿puede o no? ¿Puede, puede apagar esa luz? That makes me very happy. ¿Sí? Oh, qué bueno. Sí. Así es. Así es. ¿Listo? Ya. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias, Blomley. Sí. Bueno. Muchas gracias. Ahí está. Creo que hay otra ahí arriba también. Muchas gracias. Y bueno, con eso cerramos. Con eso cerramos la sesión de la tarde. O sea, la primera sesión de la tarde. Ahí vamos a tener un pequeño eh, café aquí al lado como en la mañana y después volvemos a las cuatro y media para eh, la sesión de los documentales. 4.45 me avisan. de Ya, ya cambiamos un poquito el cronograma ahí. Entonces 4.45 volvemos para los documentales. Así que eso. Muchas gracias. Chao. <risa>